thank you everybody for coming. Uh, I'm, I'm Christian Bass and I'm going to chair this session. Uh, and I will leave, give the word to Ricardo and Francesca in a minute. Uh, we have to say that it was a decision of the um, organizing committee to expand the discussion that was brought to the session that uh, Francesca and uh, Ricardo were organizing into a wider audience so that everybody can participate. They were dealing with issues that the participants of their session were dealing with issues that involve uh, wider questions that all of us are interested on, uh, uh, that are crucial ethical issues about research with human subjects be it uh, humans in societies as we anthropologists, uh, social anthropologists are more uh, accustomed to, be it with the traces and remains and actual um, bodies of uh, human beings that existed in the past. So because of the interest of the issues they were dealing with and also because there's a heated debate going on uh, between communities of <coughs> two different countries at least, we thought that we would all benefit from the possibility of, of having the input of a wider audience to this discussion. So I uh, suggested to Francesco, uh, Francesca and Ricardo that we could expand the scope of their session into a plenary and they were gladly uh, accepted and I'm very happy that they were um, uh, into doing it, and uh, this is why we're here in the plenary, and I hope this is a heated, passionate, but uh, uh, mostly learning discussion. We also invited our distinguished uh, colleague, Vitor Oliveira Jorge, a fellow uh, man of many uh, arts, but uh, mostly known as an archaeologist, who has been a part of public discussions and the implications of uh, uh, traces of the past as public, uh, in the public domain and as uh, uh, something that we all should care about. He was uh, an active participant in the discussions of the Paleolithic uh, arts uh, that exists up north and that was, uh, 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 that were in a place that where a big dam was going to be built and it was an issue that involved the entire public uh, uh, domain in Portugal some uh, 15 years ago. And it's still, in 95, and uh, it's still uh, an issue and it's uh, something uh, where, for once, uh, anthropologists and archaeologists uh, won to the uh, uh, electricity dam uh, builders. So it was a very, very neat case. So uh, we are very happy that Victor accepted. Uh, to come and now I give the word also. Uh, thank you, Ugo, for being uh, uh, on Skype. Uh, Ugo is speaking from uh, Canada. He couldn't come in person. Uh, his uh, fellow uh, writer uh, uh, came, and I hope she's uh, still. Um, and uh, we'll uh, have the discussion with all of them. I'm going to give the word to Francesca and Ricardo, and then to each one of the uh, participants in the debate, and then we'll open to the public. Thank you. So, which one of them is that? Okay, um, so, thank you, Christiana. You almost said everything, so there's not, not much for me to introduce now. But uh, actually, uh, just want to tell you how this came up. It was, uh, it was um, uh, an outcome of our, of our uh, panel that we uh, organized about uh, scientific collections and collections about body parts uh, and thinking collections in archives, in science and in medicine. And uh, fortunately we had uh, proposals from uh, actually four physical anthropologists. Uh, three of them are now here. Uh, I guess the other one is there at the, at the audience. Maybe she would like to use it after. But these uh, three physical anthropologists, they are uh, at the table uh, now. They uh, uh, are part of this debate that is taking place in Portugal about uh, skeleton collections, human identified skeleton collections that uh, are part of a project of one of these physical anthropologists, which is Hugo Cardoso, and propose them uh, to, to be um, 
lands to a uh, university in Canada. But uh, I would like to do, I'm not part of the debate, so I'd like to, to, to give the, uh, the word uh, to, to, give the, to the three uh, participants uh, in this debate and to, to Vitor who will comment uh, also. And, and just to, to, to thank everyone who accepted to uh, Hugo, to Francisca, to uh, Susanna and to Vitor who accept to be, to be here. Um, so, and I guess that's it. Thank you all for being present also. Okay. Should I start? Yeah, uh, I'll just I'll just say a few words. Then I'd like to uh, um, say good afternoon to everyone and to say hello to uh, Professor Vitor Oliveira Jorge and to Professor Cristiano Bastos, and also uh, say hello to my colleagues uh, Francisca and Susana, uh, as well as to the organizers uh, Ricardo and uh, Francesca uh, and for organizing this debate uh, and also to the audience I'm not sure uh, whether it's a full room or not but I just like to say hello to everyone good <laughs> hello everyone um, so at the start I just want to say a few words uh, I think this is an important uh, space for uh, clarification, uh, specifically for clarification about uh, the project that I'm undertaking. Um, and like all ethical issues, uh, I don't think any of the sides has uh, the complete reason or the whole reason about the issues and uh, mitigation of those ethical or moral concerns is achieved by dialogue. So again, I appreciate the organization of this debate. Uh, the other thing that I want to say briefly before we actually start uh, and, um, and discuss the issues at hand uh, is that physical anthropology uh, is at the crossroads between the ethical principles of science uh, and the advancement of knowledge uh, for the benefit of peoples and individuals, uh, their uh, health and their well-being, but also um, the ethical principles of anthropology and the power of cultural relative relativism um, that empowers people and encourages uh, toleration and encourages reconciliation between peoples. So having said that, I um, wish all the best for the debate and uh, I'll pass along the word to the rest of my uh, debate uh, colleagues. Wouldn't you like to present what's, what's at stake? Would you like to wait for uh, us to present it and then you rebut? Uh, it's really up to you. I, I wasn't inform okay. about the, the exact okay. Okay, so structure the of the debate. So okay. I can start by clarifying two things which are, I think are some of the okay. most important ones at the beginning, but I, we, we can do this later. We can go okay. around. Okay. Um, okay. So we will present from here and then you uh, enter the debate. That's good. Uh, so Francisco can you... Uh, hello, hello to all the audience. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, hello, I haven't seen you for a while. Uh, I think for me this debate is very important. For those who don't know, I am uh, currently doing a research project on the Portuguese human identified collections. Uh, so this is the opportunity to voice some of uh, my, um, I wouldn't call them concerns, I would call them uh, the need to think about how uh, the possibility of uh, building collection exists in Portugal with such a facility that now this facility is extended to the possibility of exporting a human skeleton remains to, in the presently we're discussing Canada, but we never know. 
So uh, for me, and Hugo knows this, because when I applied for my FCT grant, I did send him my proposal. I don't think you remember, but at the time he said something like, be careful, you're probably opening Pandora's box. <laughs> Which, yes, well, the door... I clearly remember that. Yeah. So uh, for me, it was fine. What I told him at the time, I believe, was I, I don't mind. I just, I want things to be talked about because it's important. Because these collections, they are a powerful tool for research in anthropology. They are magnificent in all of it. Now, not only the biological aspect that allows to create models of research on age, sexing, and disease, but also in all the human aspect of it. It allows us to discuss the biology and what's on the other side of the curtain, which is us as actors that build the collections. So I think it's extraordinary. And uh, in all this context, of, uh, which was started by Hugo's re uh, request, or Hugo's project of building an identified collection in Canada with human skeletal remains from Portugal, I think this is an excellent opportunity, uh, a bit very, uh, I would say, fiery way to start this whole debate, but I'm glad it started. Uh, but for me, more than remains, and I know Susanna doesn't agree with me, and I know other colleagues from biological anthropology don't agree with me, and I wish they could be also here to talk about it. But for me, the, the question starts before the request of exploitation, before the request of the universities to access the remains. It starts with the word of unclaimed remains, which allows for these remains to be either curated in new collections or now ask for exploitation. It starts with that single word that defines the remains that nobody cares about you. But on the other side, as researchers, and in this context of questioning, is research for society? Which are the ethical boundaries? Do we gain more? Do we lose more? Where does we place humanity? So this is where I'm standing. So for me, the, all of this is a process of reflexiveness, of being an anthropologist, that on one side study human remains, because I do study them, and I did study the collections, and I continue to study collections, and the other side, there's the other person, more with a, a rib, so, pardon my, uh, the use of the word, but a rib of social cultural anthropology that uh, questions, okay, uh, is, this, is this all right or not? Can, can we actually do this? Because remember that a uh, human skeleton is not just the bone, it has everything in it. You can extract the DNA. You can know everything about it. Just think about that. So if you are unclaimed, anyone that is unclaimed, everything that is in that shell exists to be used as the person who has the creation of the collection chooses to. So I think it's very interesting. And I think this is why I think the debate should start before all of that in the word of unclaimed. Sorry? It's not this one. I know that, but I think I should make my position clear here also. Okay, let me punctuate, let me punctuate ago, uh, again. As a chair, I have the obligation of uh, trying to wrap and uh, bring to you this is uh, how a local issue about specific skeletons that were in a Lisbon uh, graveyard this defined as unclaimed can make their way to another country for scientific purposes. It's not the point about those skeletons, about those, the acts that brought, were uh, made the human remains travel from one place to the other with all that it brings about what, uh, what they belong to, what can be made of them. It's a universal problem that all of us, anthropologists from the social variety, from the biological variety, from the archaeological variety, are faced with when we want to, f when we have to face the unlimited desire of knowing more and the need to respect the boundaries of, uh, that uh, ethics uh, uh, bring us to. And for those of us who uh, never thought about it, let us uh, go back to uh, the mid century, what happened when scientists with unlimited possibilities of exploring, uh, 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 doing their research over human subjects, did 
what brought to the Holocaust, what brought to the Second World War, and the backlash of that, which was the sort of uh, scientific the requirements for research on human subjects that bound us today to very strict uh, uh, limitations. So this is what is at stake. We are dealing with a particular issue, some, some bones that exist in one place and that, that are moving to another place, but we are addressing universal issues that affect all of us. So that's what I would like to punctuate now. Hi. Uh, I'm going to direct to the subject. Here I have three points that I want to present or to, to ask. Uh, one, uh, you, one, uh, one question is uh, the exportation issue. You have here an exportation issue. We are, our uh, uh, Lisbon municipi municipally are going to send between 100 and 200 skeletons to Canada. To, uh, this is one, one question. The exportation of human remains, Portuguese human remains, um, to a country that does not allow to have human remains and claim in their universities. So apparently we are sufficiently other to be taken to his to this university. The second point is that the skeletons are not going to a university because our collections belong to institutions. These uh, bones are going uh, to be cared by a researcher. Mm -hmm. This is, to me, this is a difference. Our collections are inside institutions. Uh, another point is our public institutions because Apparently, or, uh, our public institutions should care by our identity. We, as Portuguese, have the right to have a positive identity. And our public institutions are not aware of that, or don't care about that. Because for me, it is humiliating that Portuguese skeletons can go to a university in Canada and to be searched for, or, I don't know. And I'm very glad that we have here English uh, people that uh, know very well this uh, question of repatri repatriation. I would like to hear from them about this. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, now, Ubu, could you please uh, enter your feedback on the or your views on the subject? Please. Thank you. Uh, of course. Um, uh, maybe what will help the audience and also my colleagues to understand a little bit better of what's happening is to start from the beginning and uh, actually I'm not going to actually start from the beginning, we'll start a little further down the road. In 2014 I approached the City Hall to um, study the possibility of bringing uh, human remains, uh, unplanned human remains from the cemeteries in Lisbon, in Lisbon to my university. Uh, on a temporary basis. Now, my colleagues at the table will say that that's not the case. Um, the, the discussions with the City Hall were always discussed as a long-term, but temporary loan, if you will, and there's emails that were exchanged with the City Hall uh, where that's very clear. However, uh, and obviously that's, for, that's, uh, that's, that's my fault and also that's uh, the City Hall's fault. We were somewhat naive at the beginning, uh, but there were very clear reasons why formally everything was dealt as a donation. Um, one of the reasons was that cemeteries don't donate things, or sorry, cemeteries don't loan human remains or any other type of material evidence. Uh, so donations seem the most appropriate way formally for this to happen. Um, another reason was that uh, because we're dealing with the movement of remains from one country to the other, in Canada there's no ownership of human remains. No one can own human remains. So you can say that remains have been donated but they're not, they're not owned by anyone. That's um, actually, the, that's, uh, that the origins of that is from British legislation where no one can own human remains. So initially we thought that this was the best way to approach formally the institutions as a donation. And this is how 
the National Ethics Commission for the Life Sciences uh, assessed the request by the City Hall uh, and according to the Ethics Commission, they could not find uh, an ethical or a legal or ethical um, obstacle for this to happen. Uh, the National Institute of Legal Medicine was of the same opinion. So things move naturally as a donation. Um, the City Hall eventually voted unanimously for the transportation of human remains from, this, from the um, Lisbon cemeteries to Simon Fraser University. And it was at this point that I was approached by a reporter from Diário de Notícias, who wrote a small uh, piece on the newspaper, uh, which I guess sparked the discussion. And what is uh, most puzzling to me, because if, um, so this wasn't planned, the, the news in the, in the newspaper wasn't planned, uh, and I really didn't knew if the project would, would move forward before, obviously, the, the city council uh, vote. So it seemed um, unnecessary to start, a, start any type of discussion if, if nothing would to, would to happen. So I was somewhat surprised with my peers in Portugal when they knew about the project on the newspaper and uh, the response was to write to the newspapers again. Uh, so I was a bit surprised with that. Uh, I tried to talk to some of my peers. Uh, a lot of them didn't want to talk to me, didn't want to discuss on a personal basis some of the issues. Uh, and I have to say that all of them uh, uh, know the details of the project by what was conveyed by the, new, the news in public. And a lot of what was conveyed by the news in public group is either inaccurate or uh, just outright biased. <clears throat> and I'm glad that we had having this conversation because that provides me with the opportunity to clarify some of the things. So again, uh, the, the, the project was dealt with formally as a donation, but it was never meant as a donation, as it was meant as a uh, temporary loan, if you will. And eventually, uh, uh, Professor Eugenia Cunha and Dr. Sidal Eduard met with the City Hall, expressed their concern, and I assume of um, other of my peers, and the formality of the project has been changed from a donation to a loan. So that's the, the formality of the project now has been uh, transformed into a loan, although uh, it has not been voted by the city council because the, the terms have been have, have changed. Now, so that's that's one of the, that's kind of the, the, the main clarifications that I wanted uh, to make. Um, and I would like to um, to maybe know from my peers or my colleagues at the table um, if donation is the issue at hand because both of them mentioned exportation. So I'm not sure what they mean by exportation. Is this, a, they see exportation as a permanent movement of things or a temporary movement of things? Uh, so maybe I could, they could clarify if, if the donation is an issue that they are concerned with. Uh, and the other one is that I'd like my uh, colleague Susanna to clarify um, because she has stated in the um, news clip in public and, and just in a few minutes <clears throat> that universities in Canada do not allow human remains to be studied or to be curated. I wonder where she got that information from um, because that's not true. I work at a Canadian university. I work with human remains. Human remains can and are curated on a regular basis at many universities. Uh, modern human remains are curated at uh, medical schools, at anthropology and archaeology departments. Uh, there's issues of indigenous versus non-indigenous skeletal material, and there's issues of repatriation that are important. They're not entirely relevant to the discussion because the context of North America is very different from the context of Europe. 
It's a concept of European colonization that is not the context of European archaeology, and that has to be very clear. And I know these issues in quite detail because I'm part of my department's commission for repatriation. Uh, so I'd like to get some clarification from my colleagues um, uh, on, on it. And also, um, so because uh, my colleague Susanna mentioned the exportation, so this, uh, are they seeing this as a problem of permanent or temporary transportation? Uh, she also mentioned the issues of institutions. I didn't quite understand what she meant by the issues of institutions. That because institutions were not um, involved, institutions were not consulted. I'm not sure uh, what uh, she meant by humiliation exactly. Why is it, is it humiliating to do this? And I think that's important to clarify. Um, and also, what's also not correct is that the uh, loan is, if, uh, if you want to update the terms of the project, it's not being made to myself or in my name. Obviously, my name is mentioned in the documentation, but the loan is made to Simon Fraser because that's where I work, and it's through the university that the remains are being loaned. So it doesn't make sense that saying that the remains are being loaned or donated to an individual, because I'm not bringing them to my home. They're going to be curated at, at university. So they, uh, the, the, the loan and the process is being dealt through the university, uh, which includes, for example, example uh, a review by the Ethics Commission in my university. So that's my clarification for now. Maybe we can, uh, we can move on from, from here. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Hugo. And uh, may I uh, stress again that although this starts as a debate or a dissension, this is about universal issues. So we're going to keep the discussion at what are what is at stake that involves all of us. What are wh what can we learn from this particular issue when a collection of bones that uh, uh, has a history or is in a special as uh, legal situation that travels. I'm not saying exporting or importing or uh, loaning or uh, giving yet. It's uh, moving from one place to the other and they will take it as that. And we will all learn from one particular issue to wider issues. So we will also, I uh, expect that all of us involved, Susanna, uh, Francisca and Hugo will take the opportunity of uh, uh, hearing what the audience will ask them and then we'll have another round. So now it is time for uh, Victor to make a comment what archaeology and his experience can bring about uh, to this debate and then we'll expand it and we'll go back to the, to the table. Okay, thank you. Thanks Hugo very much. Well, uh, I don't know exactly what I can say because uh, I was not aware of all this problem until uh, Christiana contacted me some short time ago and I'm being very busy with other subjects. So uh, we are here uh, in, a, in a scientific controversy which is, which is very different from another one where I participated actively in the 90s that uh, was mentioned by Christiana because at that time we had in Portugal a huge problem. It is, I think you are hearing me. You can hear me. Um, we had a, I, I'm going only to make reference to this problem very, very shortly. Um, we had a, a big issue in Portugal because there was an enormous dam programmed a long ago for a river in the north of Portugal. And uh, this dam would, would cover uh, an enormous area with uh, very, very rare prehistoric engravings which uh, are unique in the world. Now they are classified by UNESCO as human heritage or mankind heritage. And uh, a few Portuguese, a very few people in Portugal, because we had not that art before practically, knew about the importance of that heritage. It was a unique heritage. It's most important 
archaeological heritage existing in Portugal and probably in general the most important heritage in general that we have in Portugal because they are unique they are hundreds and hundreds of upper paleolithic engravings in the world unique so uh, we needed to, to struggle against this dam because of course if it was done we would be considered as a country of savages and we could not do any archaeology anymore in Portugal we would lost lost any uh, moral or ethical <coughs> capacity to keep working I was at that moment uh, the head of my faculty also I was an archaeologist, a non-archaeologist already, so uh, I played a part, but of course it was an enormous movement of everybody in Portugal, of many, many students of the secondary schools, of my, also my, part of my colleagues, and many, many people uh, from uh, everywhere. Uh, it suffices to say that I've published, I've coordinated a book about the subject, about this controversy, sick as this, uh, the dossier uh, for Schoen, the dossier core. Well, uh, it is a different question here. This question, uh, I will try not to do any n nonsense, this question is about a colleague, a Portuguese colleague uh, in uh, uh, biological anthropology who is in Canada now and uh, asked for uh, using some skeletons uh, of Portuguese origin in his study, in his scientific study and also uh, for pedagogical reasons to use it, to use them, the skeletons, in his uh, courses. Um, there was, it seems, a certain void of uh, legislation about this uh, uh, problem, about this possibility of uh, <coughs> transportation of r remains of skeleton remains of human remains to another country um, and the, there is a controversy here or a, a contradictory aspect that was already uh, well uh, underlined by my colleague uh, for one and on one hand, we want to develop knowledge and uh, we want to develop science and we want not to establish any kind of limit to the development of science. That's one point. The other point, which is contradictory to this first one, is that uh, we need to establish some rules, uh, some rules between colleagues, first of all, and then between countries and institutions in order not to create the sense of any kind of, uh, you know, humiliation or uh, some kind of colonization by one country uh, to another, uh, one country not uh, uh, being uh, being uh, able to use their own skeletons uh, to these uh, works and uh, asking for skeletons of other countries. So um, the problem uh, here for me is, first of all, if I was in the place of my colleague in Canada, uh, but it, does, it is always easy to say something like this when we are outside. Uh, I probably would, uh, in the first uh, place, uh, talk to my colleagues and say, uh, here in, in my uh, university I don't have the material necessary to my study. So I need to uh, resolve this problem any, any, anyhow, anyway. And uh, uh, if it is for only his scientific study, his particular scientific study, of course, is very experienced in working in Portugal, you would come here and make the, uh, proceed to their studies, to his studies here. But it's not only that problem, he, he wants also the, the skeletons to his courses. So, uh, I would probably arrange things with my colleagues not to establish these uh, polemics which also uh, always uh, make an enormous waste of time. I only have five minutes. Okay. Uh, but uh, now it's, it's too late for that. Uh, I, I don't have any problem in, in principle of uh, lowering uh, any, any material from my country to another country or to another institution in another country as long as there is a formal agreement, a very 
specific formal agreement in order to protect uh, that uh, material, that scientific material. It, it may circulate, it shall circulate, circulate, of course, between uh, uh, people, between scientific people, with uh, an idea of you know uh, improving science and improving knowledge, but uh, based in a very important and formal knowledge of everybody about what is the issue and uh, a formal agreement between institutions and so on. I think it's important that. And uh, uh, as questions of uh, you know um, identity, uh, identity is a word I. Personally, I'm very fear uh, of, of that word because I don't know what is uh, really identity, what is Portuguese identity, or or anything. The the what I, I knew I re read in these uh, papers that people sent to me is that um, uh, these skeletons uh, in uh, Portuguese cemeteries come to a point where they are not uh, uh, claimed by the families and uh, they are going to be burned, so destroyed. If the, the Portuguese institutions where my colleagues work have the conditions to incorporate all this material, of course they should incorporate this material. Then uh, probably they could establish some agreements between colleagues and institutions in order to loan, uh, to lend this material for a certain time to colleagues outside, uh, abroad. And everything could be solved in a very simple way. Uh, avoiding problems of identity, avoiding, avoiding problems of colonization, or avoiding problems of humiliation. No, we are peers, uh, we are states, and uh, we should improve science in a very open way. But this open way cannot go against uh, not only the interest of the Portuguese scientists who uh, work in Portugal, and also with some ethical and very complicated problems, if the families of these uh, people who were dead, uh, just remember after many years uh, that uh, they have these corpses and they needed to uh, reclaim or uh, claim for these uh, remains in a certain point of time. We should be uh, absolutely sure that they are going to be destroyed or they are incorporated for scientific reasons in uh, uh, Portuguese institutions and uh, at some time they could be in part uh, uh, loaned to, to uh, uh, abroad in order to improve science which is of course an international issue that interests everybody and not exactly a particular scientific uh, institution or person. That is my uh, general uh, point of view. Well, thank you very, thank you very much Victor. Um, we have now a moment for uh, taking questions. I think there are several issues at table, in the table. Uh, we are in a moment when uh, most of the collections coexist with the needs of repatriation. Repatriation is the word that any curator of these days uh, knows. And at the same time, we faced with situations where um, the opposite is also happening. So we are having a live case study of the circulation of a collection very much like the ones we study as case studies of uh, circulating bones from colonial sites, from uh, different places. So are we up to still do our research as Hugo is proposing and abide by the ethical requirements and the needs uh, that are behind all the repatriation issues uh, in a civilized manner in a, a, a way that um, uh, fulfills the ethical requirements of today. So this is the general question we have uh, for and I think we can go back to this particular case with a more general view on what is at stake when personal rem uh, human remains, objects that are associated with the human life circulate and are attributed to different meanings, okay? So we are very used to this discussion in colonial times. Now it's, uh, uh, you know, who's the colonial to whom in this case? It's a good question that we can put. So the floor is open and I'll take uh, questions too, from anyone. Should I start? Okay, okay the microphone so that you can hear you. Can hear you.
Yes, Okay, my name is Clara Saraiva and I've worked on death for the past 30 years. Uh, my first work on death was in the United States with the funeral directors when I did my master's thesis back in the 80s, so I'm old. And, um, well, I think there's many issues at stake here, really, and we're trying to put everything into the same pot, and we can't. Because you cannot mix you, the, the hand, handling human remains with, uh, you know, taking a, a masterpiece that was taken from Egypt during colonialism and is now laying in the British Museum. It, it is, in a sense, like Christiana said, okay, it's similar, but it's not the same thing. Because, of course, there's ethical and colonial questions, post-colonial questions, and all the issues that come with taking that masterpiece from Egypt or wherever in Africa or wherever in the world to the British Museum, of course, but there are also a lot of issues when you use human remains. And, of course, the ethical issues when you use human pieces, so to say, are much stronger for me as a, a social and cultural anthropologist. I'm not a physical anthropologist, okay? So I do not work with bones, I work with people who have had other people who died and are turning into bones. So, that's the first thing for me. The second thing is, I put things in a different perspective, I must say. I think that if nowadays, in, a, in our Western world, because it, of course this does not happen all over the world, but if in the Western world we have laws, like in Portugal, where you are, you donate your organs, your bodily organs, unless you specifically write down that you are not going to be a donor, and that is done in the name of science, of course this poses a lot of ethical problems, but this is the law nowadays. If I give my heart or my lungs or my kidneys, if, if, if I die tomorrow, and Personally, I agree this is so, because I will be dead, so I, I'm hoping that these organs will help somebody else. So, in that sense, I don't see any problem with using human remains, such as bones, skeletons, to be used for scientific purposes. Okay, this is the first point. The second point, of course, is the issue of colonization, uh, etc., etc. Okay, if we expatriate loaning or donating, Okay, perhaps here loaning is the best thing to do because it implies that the material can always come back to its origins. So, but if we loan material to Canada, can Canada also loan material to us? This would be the reciprocal, uh, ethical way to do it, I think. If you tell me, okay, but we have in Portugal a lot of human remains that are not being studied because we don't have so many scientists and we don't have so many places to do it, which is true. I've worked in cemeteries all over the country for the past 30 years and I can tell you there's heaps of bones lying around that are going to be burned. So in that sense, I don't see why they cannot be used for scientific purposes if all the ethical and you know, legal, etc., etc., procedures are done correctly. This is my position as a social and cultural anthropologist. Also, and the last but not the least, we're not talking about bones of people who died 20 or 50 years ago. If we are, then we cannot do it. Then, of course, the families have to be asked. Then there's other procedures that have to be taken. But if you're talking about bones of people who died centuries ago, whom you cannot really trace the origins, it's, it's, if it's a, a material that belongs to humanity, and if it's good for us to study the DNA or whatever in the bones that I'm not acquainted with, why not do it? If, you know, if this is my, well, to start, but I know I'm throwing a lot of wood or in, the, in the fire, but I think this is what, what we sat here for, to have a debate. Yes. And to have a debate, you need to have different opinions and you need to debate them. Mm. Thank, Thank you very you. much, yeah, uh, Clara. And may I ask uh, all of you, Francisca, Suzanne, and you, do please, to take notes of this because we're going to the room and then we'll go back to each of you. So please take a note of the questions so that you can address them. I used to have Miguel. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, I'd just like to make a couple of points. Uh, uh, one of them is that there seems to be a very uh, thin line between uh, notions of um, self-respect among communities and uh, outright uh, nationalism. 
And I think we need, as anthropologists, to distinguish between the two. I mean, one thing is to talk about communities that have historically been oppressed or colonized or, uh, and that a claim for repatriation based on that historical power relation. Another thing is to use arguments that, at the end of the day, just, you know, they, they just a nationalistic emotion, okay, shaped by uh, specific ideological options, which people, of course, have full rights to uphold, but, you know. And um, the sense that bones belong to a country is, um, in my opinion, this is a personal opinion, I'm not talking as an anthropologist, I'm talking as myself. Um, uh, it's, in my opinion, totally wrong. I am a Portuguese citizen, I mean, I happen to be a Portuguese citizen. I don't own the bones of other Portuguese uh, citizens, uh, and much less so from the remote past, much less so if the bones are unclaimed, and much less so, and this is the second point and I'll finish, and I'm being, you know, provocative on purpose. The second point is, much more so, if there isn't a cultural um, apparatus and set of beliefs about bones. Right? Because there isn't. I mean, it's partial. It goes away with time. They destroy it. They destroy it. And they destroy it if people don't claim them. And we know that from our family stories. All of us. Right? And there is not that kind of connection uh, in general. And, uh, and so I, I think we need to, to separate these two points. I mean, what kind of sets of beliefs do you have about remains first? And that's culturally relative in the good sense of the word. And the other one, what kind of historical power relations are implied in communities that may want repatriation of whatever, as opposed to not communities but nation states where some of its citizens, namely citizens, will claim, based on a nationalistic ideological argument, that those things are ours, and reverse colonial relations. And to do this in Portugal is particularly problematic. Yeah. To reverse this in Portugal is particularly problematic. I mean, I think we have to be extremely careful from an ethical and political point of view to start using expressions such as we are being colonized or someone is doing something colonial to us. I mean, first let's clean the house and then we can talk about that. Thank you very much, Miguel. Thank you very much, Miguel. Now it's Heather, please. Thank you. Hi. Um, it's okay? Okay. Um, I'm Heather. I'm medical anthropology, but with a feminist lens. I'm going to take a bit of a different approach with my question. Because I'm hearing something that's not necessarily about the bones, but about two countries and histories and people and all the actors within this and within the process of developing research. And the fact, maybe I need some more clarification on this, but I'm wondering if there was a collaboration even through the ethics application through these moments of where there's the decision of what will be asked about, where there's the decision of what will happen, where there is the intent, where there is the discussion. I mean, if you're going to talk about, um, you're going to talk about the Holocaust. You're going to talk about the times where science was used in many ways, but there was it, it was completely unethical. You're talking about a time where only one side got to make decisions, where only one voice was heard, and in the case of the bones, they can't speak for themselves. <laughs> which is the case. But there are people here that are close enough to the culture that have studied the history that know and that collaboration between both sides of the story, between both groups, is something that I'm wondering if, if it happened more than I'm hearing or if it's something that was considered or how this is. Because I'm not necessarily hearing this as an issue of lending human remains physically the actual remains themselves, but as two cultures that are coming together and looking at a new sort of point in history and a new discussion with all the history, with all the cultural significance and everything else included. Like in the last session, I think there was a discussion about how the Portuguese bones are other enough to be in a university in Canada. And that's something to discuss. That's something 
to, so are, is the history being discussed of these bones? Will it be something that comes up? Are the identities, even unclaimed bones, but the possible understanding and identities in life, and will that be something that's included when they're taught or when the course comes up kind of thing? I'm, I'm just wondering about that aspect. Thank you. Thank you very much for the contribution. And now it's Alexander and then... Thank you. Well, uh, by the way, Hugo uh, knows me because, well, we've never met. It's good to see you finally. You wrote me, I think, a year ago or so. If you can use the collection from Bucharest, the Francis Reiner collection, for study. You wrote uh, particularly about implants, skulls, and skeletons. I don't know if you remember. But I've never heard anything since, so I don't know what happened. But uh, here I would like to, make, to ask a question and make a comment. And my question would be regarding, in a way, Heather's comment and others, that usually, being coming from a, an osteological, I'm an osteologist, but also interested in the ethics and uh, history of anatomical collections, if we want to study human remains, we need to make an application at any university around the world, and you need to justify why you need to study those individuals in particular. And because I'm not familiar with this case, I would be curious, how was the application made? Was it justified for a specific research topic? Or if it was for teaching purposes, how do you justify the need of 100 skeletons or skulls for teaching? Uh, when you need, if you just teach the basic methods, you don't need that many. And this comes back to a debate I can, uh, I think the, rec the most recent debate I uh, witnessed on a similar topic was in Cambridge where Charlotte Roberts, well, the big name when it comes to pathology, and she has dealt with such uh, issues of moving human remains around the world in her paleopathological uh, process, and she was appalled by how people just send samples from all around the world without being curious what happens with the sample, why were they asked to provide samples, and she was prompting people to ask questions and to only send samples if there is a strong justification because be behind the word science, so I, uh, I'm not implying something here, but there's good science and bad science, and the word science doesn't really just justify things. And uh, my comment, just to wrap this up, my comment would be that I think what is a question here, seeing that you can't, and going back to Heather's comment, is that they, they're, the assumptions are not made explicit, because how do we actually see these human remains? Do we value them as an individual, as a persona, and then we see them, uh, there is no difference if it's my mother or if it's a skeleton from 5,000 years ago, we would treat them ontologically on the same level, or we see them only for our own use. And that's a very pragmatic perspective that can also commodify them, but we should just be honest and make things explicit, and then I think we can start a discussion. Thank, Thank you very much. Yes. Still one question. Okay, um, so first I would like to say uh, that I I agree and thank you for the questions you made because it made clear what I wanted to ask. And one thing that I think it's important to ask is if it's not possible in the Canada to study so, so recent uh, human remains from the 19th and then 20th century, um, not in a nationalist way, but uh, why is it okay uh, without making a partnership or without consulting other investigators in Portugal or doing something that would probably be beneficial also for Portugal and also for Canada to study these remains. So what I wanted to, to understand is if we do have laws that uh, make it okay to study these remains and Canada doesn't, how can we make it this beneficial for both? since uh, the laws apply differently to these countries, but we both want to do um, science. Yeah, that's it. Well, thank you very much. I think it's time to go back to the participants. Would you like to start with yeah. this? Yeah, okay. I'll be quick, I'll be quick. I'm very happy for all this conversation. I just keep typing notes. Yeah, that's uh, um, so the qualifications, 
The remains are recent. The so like you have the remains in collections which died in 2009. So the recent remains. I don't know the chronology of the remains that may or not or may not be going to Canada. Uh, so another thing is, Clara, I have a, a question for you, it's more of a provocation. Okay, a provocation, uh, I know you we talked about your opinion about the remains and you're okay and you understand about it all, but what if you see these remains? I think it's a ghost. Okay. <laughs> okay, if, if, uh, if we think about these remains as, as the results of inequalities in death, how would you address that? Because the issue is, and this goes to the unclaim, most of the remains, they are unclaimed, okay, some of them, okay, relatives don't care about them, that's true. But others, they don't get the letters. Others, they cannot afford to rebury the remains. I'm sorry, they can't. Closer to you. Closer to me? No, no. Okay. Okay, so uh, they are unclaimed because... You have to tell them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, stop writing, stop writing. Okay, so uh, unclaimed remains, sorry. I lost my train of thought. Unclaimed remains, uh, money issues, okay. Uh, other relatives really don't care about our remains, which I understand that too. Uh, others, people migrate, the address is no longer the same, you don't get the letter. Five years later or ten years later you come back, you don't have your relative in the grave. So this, all this complexity of human behavior, we should consider. This is why, this is why my question is about loan donation, and I know Sven doesn't agree with me and other colleagues from biological anthropology. My question is on the unclaim. What does it mean? People don't know. I mean, I've, I've asked people, ordinary people, awful, but that don't work in academia, this, all this discussion for them, no, they, it's buried. No, do you know they can be unburied? No, don't say that. This is a reality. I know, they should. It's okay. much more complex. Yes, it's complex, thank you. This is why we should talk about it. Okay. So, uh, but another thing I, I want to also to say is all this conversation about accessing remains, we, we're forgetting something about uh, the burial ground. Burial ground is a community. So if we want to talk about what happens to the remains that are unclaimed, maybe we should bring other parties in. I think, I think for me it would be very interesting to have someone from the city council saying, how, is it okay, okay, they follow the rules, ethically they had the, the report, it was all fine, we know the, uh, the legislation is great, but it would be very interesting to understand that because cemeteries are running out of space, so we need to think about all of that, uh, these are uh, these are issues that are very important for uh, living people also. Um, and so apart from that, we should include other communities, so even such as uh, including religious and other belief groups, because this uh, vacating of space it may come to them if we run out of space, which is a reality. Population is growing old, <laughs> but cremation now is an ongoing practice, so we're also changing our beliefs. So we have to consider all of that. Do we have to consider all of that? We have to consider all of that, and there's a lot of things that have to be considered. For instance, if you look from an historical point of view, I don't know if all Yes, but before, that, before, uh, what, before... What happened to the bones in Portugal? Yes, but look, I'm not going to that because that's another story. It's what I'm another saying another story because it's directly connected with the attitude of Portuguese towards human remains and what's happening now with nowadays, the fact that in the last 20 years, cremation went up. Yes, because there's no space, it's cheaper. It's chair not only that it's cheaper. The chair is taking over. <laughs> I'm here here. Biological anthropologists listen to social anthropologists. You, Hugo, Francisca, and uh, Susanna, please listen to specialists on death, that they have something that maybe, this is not just about bones, it's not just about a physicality yes. that's, uh, you know, of course the city of Lisbon wants to get rid of the skeletons. It's very expensive to keep reburying and burning and do whatever. So it's like very uh, heavenly proposal that somebody is giving the dignity to the bones to go be objects of study. It's fantastic for the city of Lisbon. Is it only about bones that are a physicality or is that something more that is attributed to that? And we are, thank, apology, but this is a 
social anthropology, so we want to include the social dimension, the symbolic dimension that we all deal with to this issue. Also, it's not just about the Egyptian mummy or something that's being repatriated. You know, mo the most basic things, buttons, belts, the wanton belts in Canada. I was recently in North Ottawa. I learned so much about the animated belts that are being repatriated. So there are dimensions that you should at least contemplate anticipating when you're doing a research protocol that involves moving one thing to the other. Something that's, that has a value, that has different values. There are, you said it, there's a prime academic value in bones. You can extract from that a lot of knowledge and you can turn it into academic uh, uh, plus value. Of course we all know that and we should be clear about it and we should be honest and frank and deal with it in protocols. I don't know how you guys in uh, Ottawa, in, I'm sorry, in uh, uh, Vancouver are going to deal with it, but I'm sure you have the best intentions of dealing with it in a clear manner, transparent manner that involves maybe institutions in the home country, maybe whatever ethics committee, I'm sure you're going to deal with that in an appropriate manner. And we know that the discussion here came not from academic institutions, but from the uh, just like in Poa, from the newspapers that made a scandal out of it and made an issue out of it and changed everything. We're used to that. But this may be an opportunity not only for us to reflect in a way that I haven't ever seen it before uh, about uh, objects and the remains and skeletons in cemeteries. I even heard today, I'm sorry, about this, that we were very attached to, uh, to skeletons because there are all these... Uh, Bone chapels, and we are, as Miguel said, horrified. No, nobody wants to deal with bones from contemporary Portugal, except for some of us that use it for study, or maybe somebody that has a passion for it. But there are all these stereotypes also running around, and it's interesting to deal with it, and this is an opportunity to discuss it at a wider level, and also to learn a lesson about being more equal when it comes to research partnership, decolonize the difference in power relations, I don't care who's the colonial and the colonized here, you can see it in different ways, the opposite way, you know, both. But what I care for is that there is often, an unique, as you said in the feminist angle, there's often an unequal power relationship that's behind the way research is conducted or collections are kept. And we as anthropologists that want to you know, purpose, better knowledge and better use of our knowledge, we are committed to at least use our, critis, your, our critical analysis to, say, improve our practices as researchers. So I think this is what they say, and I would like to hear from you, Hugo, too, uh, if there is anything else you would like to add, if this was useful for you, if uh, you want to dialogue, you can dialogue, both of you, as colleagues, uh, all the time. But this is a moment where we so social anthropologists want to be part of the discussion because we think, we believe, that we have something to learn and to share with you. Okay, thank you. Hugo, what is yours? Um, am I going ahead, Suzanne? Um, I think Suzanne didn't, wasn't... I'm just... Should I go ahead? Because uh, Suzanne didn't have... Her turn. Susanna so privately told me she would ask, but maybe you want to change your mind or not? Uh, I would like to ask if you can study, if you can do everything, why such a trouble? And why is why such, such a trouble to come here? Why? Okay, so Hugo, are you ready? And then, uh, uh, because I cut from a uh, intestine okay. between Francisca and, uh, mm -hmm. and Clara, I'm going to her. Please, Hugo. I'm going to try to address a lot of uh, issues that were raised. Um, so I'm trying to discuss some of them. Um, I think the discussion has been very useful and very interesting. I really appreciate the comments by my colleagues, uh, uh, Clara, and I'm sorry I missed the name of the other gentleman. Uh, and, and the notion yeah. of reverse colonial relations is something that I haven't thought about that really resonates with me, so I think we should be very careful. And I think the danger here is to discuss this issue out of place or out of context. 
I think that's the real danger here. And the issue that was raised about repatriation is one of them. There's a very specific context for repatriation. All power relations, the post-colonial world is trying to deal with reconciliation uh, and, and with the claims of indigenous people that were colonized, brutalized, discriminalized, uh, 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 enslaved by Europeans in various parts of the world. So that's very important to, 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 to separate the waters. Now, um, in terms of circulation, and I'm going to try to kind of, I'm not sure if I'm going to go in order, um, but circulation of human remains in, in, in the world is, is, happens, is not necessarily very common. Uh, there were some concerns about um, why there's no circulation and that this, this is kind of probably a, a, a one-of-a-kind project. There's other collections in Canada that are from Europe and that are here on a, on a loan. So this is not unique in that respect. Uh, movement outside of borders of countries also happens and that's very clearly stated in the British Association of uh, Biological Anthropology and Osteoarchaeology. Uh, one of the pages of their website, there's a call for non-UK institutions to actually house UK remains. So uh, uh, the, um, the British are considering sending the remains, the archaeological human remains, to, to other parts of the world that are not exclusively in the UK. Um, the issue of a void of legislation, that's very true. Um, collections in Portugal were developed uh, on a gray area rather than avoid a gray area. And the interesting thing, what, or one of the interesting things that sprang out of my project is that the ethics, the letter that the Ethics Commission wrote, and that is a public document, what they've done actually is to establish the legal framework for, this, for these collections in Portugal. So the legal framework based on the traditions and practice of the law, because you can't legislate, legislate everything, they have been written down in this document written by the Ethics Commission. Um, uh, one of the issues that was raised is that um, I should have probably talked to my peers before moving ahead and, and try to have a dialogue before everything or all of this uh, has come into the public sphere. Uh, I actually tried that, and that's how this, the project starts. So I talked to some, obviously not all, I talked to some of my peers, and none of them was very open. I also have to say that I approached uh, my colleague Susanna Garcia as the curator of a similar collection at the Natural History Museum. That was my first step. So I approached her and I said that I would be interested in working with the museum. Uh, and work on a loan from the museum to my institution. And this would be a loan of, of, of new material that would be incorporated in the collection and would be loaned directly to my institution rather than being incorporated at the, in the collection at the museum. And um, my colleague wasn't uh, positive. She didn't approve uh, that kind of collaboration, so I'm not going to dwell into the details. She's probably the best person to talk about why she thought that that would not be a good way to proceed. But that was my first approach, work with the Natural History Museum Lisbon and work uh, on a loan with them. Uh, since that um, didn't move forward and I had a long relationship with the City Hall, um, I decided that I would approach them directly. Uh, it's, uh, I, I can see the issue of not talking to my peers. It's, it's, it's my fault, obviously. Uh, but I also feel that the physical anthropology community in Portugal is very small, um, which should help dialogue, but it doesn't help dialogue. Uh, there's actually uh, several other, I, I, in my opinion, and I'm not going to dwell into that, but there's other um, research projects, for example, that are going on and that have very strong ethical implications that I don't see them being discussed in the public sphere like this. I, I could be more specific later if, uh, if we want. Um, the other issue of the possibility of this collaboration uh, to extend to Portugal with the transportation of remains to Canada, that's part of my project because the other component of, of the project that I'm undertaking is that there's a strong component of return to the local Port Lisbon community. 
in terms of uh, there's an exhibition that is is is, is, is planned. Uh, uh, public workshops, seminars, public debates, uh, a website. There's a suite of things that are being planned uh, that are part of the project, which also includes potential links and um, ways to make um, Portuguese students uh, to make the, the uh, to facilitate the uh, the movement of Portuguese students and other researchers to Canada to study this collection. Um, obviously, and that's also one thing that I want to make clear, the Canadian and the Portuguese context in terms of human remains is very different. And human remains are not very easily accessed in Canada. And one of the main reasons, there's, there's two main reasons. One is the colonial history. So the human remains of indigenous uh, peoples uh, have been repatriated because they have been collected over the decades in very unlawful ways and in uh, situations where there's very strong power differentials. However, uh, a lot of archaeologists and physical anthropologists are working with indigenous communities to study their soil remains. So that's something that is happening in Canada. Not a lot of them, there's not a lot of projects like this because of a long history of discrimination and enslavement and of uh, uh, land possession from Europeans to indigenous peoples, from religious indigenous peoples. So that exists. So that's one of the reasons. The other one is that Canada is a country of Protestant tradition. And like the US and a lot of countries from nor Northern Europe, um, the history of anatomy teaching and the history and the change of attitudes towards death, towards burial, as a result of the Reformation, really changed people's perceptions towards the dead body. And that's, it's not an accident that, all, that most of these, if not all of these, identified skeletal collections that are obtained from cemeteries, the unclaimed remains that have been talked about. All of these are found in Southern Europe, the countries of Catholic or Orthodox tradition. Well, you can't find them in Northern Europe or in Northern America because of the cross tradition of burial. In, in Protestant tradition, burials are in perpetuity. Whereas in Catholic tradition, a lot of burials are temporary. There's reuse of graves. There's turnover of graves. There's a there's century old tradition of dealing with human remains. Uh, the long history in Catholic countries of circulation and, and uh, um, uh, worship of relics and the bones of saints. That's part of how Catholics see that differently from Northern America. And that has an implication in uh, legislation about medicine, about anatomy. Uh, so, for example, this has already been said, in a lot of Southern European countries, donations are based on opt-out options where people are by default donors. Uh, in North America and Northern Europe, it's the reverse. People have to make an explicit um, statement that they want to be donors. So this, these, all of these things have uh, a direct impact. And we can't use the context of North American identified collections, which are not based on cemeteries, are based on cadavers that were used in that, from uh, dissection rooms and in anatomy schools. This is a very different context. And the issue of inequality is an issue, but it's not the same. And that's, what, that's the issue that was raised by my students uh, during the panel. Uh, there's a very specific targeting of the poor people in American collections, which doesn't happen in cemetery-based collections. However, it is true that by, by using the unclaimed, we are, to some extent, using the marginalized and the poor. But there's more details into it, and I can't dwell into it because there's no time. Uh, but my student, the student that you saw early this afternoon at the panel, she's working on this issue. It's not clear-cut that the collections are part of the poorest of the poor because of the way cemeteries work. And actually, the poorest of the poor were probably buried in the communal grave, and it will never end up in uh, a collection. Uh, and people get abandoned by relatives due to all sorts of reasons. I'm going to tell you two anecdotal examples. There's two central people in the history of physical anthropology in Portugal. One is uh, Francisco Ferraz de Mestero, and the other one is Antonio Aurelio da Costa Ferreira. These were two key people at the beginnings of 
physical anthropology in Portugal. Uh, Francisco Ferraz Macedo, who is considered the father of physical anthropology in Portugal, is still in a tomb in a relatively anonymous sea in the cemetery of Alto de São João. But uh, Costa Ferreira, he's buried in the communal grave. His remains were buried in the communal grave in 1975. So there's a lot of different issues. You can't prove away context. And I'm going to stop here. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was sad. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. This is so intense that I think that you should come up with the idea of doing a multi-perspective uh, thematic issue on, on that. I can see Clara uh, saying yes, and I think you all should get together an issue because there is a huge debate. It's, not, it's interesting, uh, much beyond uh, this particular case. It raises very interesting things. As a social, cultural, medical anthropology, I have my issues. Also, I raised them earlier. Uh, there's a too simplistic way of characterizing what the Southern Europe attitude towards that uh, is in your own uh, uh, paper, but we can debate that. I'll have a, a, a time to do that when I'm not chairing the session and running into everybody's uh, opinion. So I think for the sake of uh, equality, I should give back, uh, back uh, the table for you. I have one more person from the audience asking to be heard. And if you have any other question that is really urgent, please put it now so that I can give it back to the table. Can I just make a quick clarification? Okay. Yes, please. Uh, I just want to clarify this, this issue that in Canada we can't study human remains. That's not true. And I'm just going to give you, so one, one is reason our is archaeological human remains, which are the most part, and they're indigenous, and there's colonial issues related to that. The other one are unclaimed remains in the morgue. And uh, in the province of British Columbia, okay. because in Canada it's, it's provincial law, Thank you. Uh, uh, cadavers okay. can be used for research, and bones can be curated at uh, medical schools. The difference okay. is that okay. Okay. Well, we'll law, they have okay. to be cremated, and they can it's be the issue now. It's okay. Uh, we believe you. It's okay. We can uh, come and prove later. No, it's, no. Not, it's just a clarification, but I think this thank is an you. important difference thank that needs to be clarified. That's good. I think. I think you are. I don't know whether it's appropriate, this, but I, I mean, I was thinking about this, and I, 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 I say, I, I say, it. Um, I, I make a public statement of ignorance, and uh, but I'm really curious. What do you do with these bones? I mean, I don't know, really. And I'm very curious, and perhaps can give us a hint on ethical issues implied in it. I mean, what actually are you planning to do with this collection? Uh, the first point. The second point is, um, I immediately, and perhaps reflectively, apply my professional categories as a social anthropologist, and think, should we treat these bones as human beings? Perhaps yes. Thinking to the responsibility of, yeah, yeah, <laughs> without being Laturian, <laughs> but um, why not? I mean, uh, should we treat them as people? Perhaps yes. What should my bones would think about this process in the future? Would I be happy of being birthed or studied? But also this, because it's a kind of interesting shift, thinking to the relatives, for example. Of course, a relative comes back from Germany or Canada, perhaps, and, and that does not find, find his grand, grand, great grandfather, but what is the same thing? Quite made. One, one other question, be very brief, because. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is David. Um, I'm a biological anthropologist, by the way. Um, and uh, well, you'll have to excuse me, I'm a bit disturbed because I just got a, a parking ticket. <laughs> <laughs> I just remembered a while ago that I didn't pay the parking, went out there and I had a ticket. Well, but uh, going to the, 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 the issue uh, in, in stake here, maybe I can answer. Um, sorry, I didn't get Francesco's uh, first question. Um, uh, there's a lot we, we do with the uh, bones, but I, I can give you one example. Uh, for instance, imagine that um, uh, uh, a loved one of yours uh, disappears, and uh, some human remains are found. 
and we need to do a positive identification. Uh, to do that positive identification, we need to test our methods, you know, because uh, we, we, we need to, uh, um, for instance, estimate sex, estimate age of death, uh, stuff, uh, parameters, biological parameters like that that will help uh, further down the road to, to make a, a positive identification. If you don't make that positive identification, there are a lot of implications. Uh, uh, besides, of course, returning the dead body to the, to the families, imagine that you can't get uh, a, a, an insurance price because you don't know if your relative is dead. See? Uh, how do you say that answer? Inheritance. Inheritance. The same thing. You need to identify that one. Is With this the case of this study? No, sorry. Is this the case of this study? No. Well, potentially, with so many uh, skeletons uh, that are being uh, uh, bloomed, we can develop method that will help to inject, and that's a legitimate uh, objective. Uh, so, implications are uh, very important. I, I think we all agree. Uh, I would also like to um, call your attention for another aspect. Of course, I, I am sensitive to all issues that have been raised here. Sorry, I ran out of so I'm a bit uh, tired. Uh, but, um, what was I trying to say? Oh, right. Uh, bypassing all those issues, uh, allow me to do that. The ethical um, uh, issues, all other issues. Imagine that you can indeed make that kind of loan. Uh, well, I, I'm a biological anthropologist, and I'm a Portuguese biological anthropologist working in Portugal, and so probably I'm biased, I'm partial. But I believe that uh, we're doing a first grade work here. We are very competitive researchers in Portugal. We can be compared to the best researchers in the world. And surprisingly, surprisingly we don't have the same funding. And how can we do that? How, how do we achieve this result? It's because of resources. Well, these collections are important resources for Portugal. That's what allows us to be competitive outside. You know? Uh, I, I know I'm taking a, a colder look at this, but I think it's important to, stay, to, 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 to talk about this as well. Uh, these are important resources that uh, if loans are, are, are granted, we'll be losing, we'll be losing our competitive edge. Mm, that Thank you. Purpose. Thanks very much, David. We're going to return to the table and we'll have to close very soon. We've been through colonialism, we've been through resources, we've been through capital, academic capital, partnerships, ethics, relationship between the communities, there's a lot in the table and I think that's going to be an exciting publication if you guys agree on doing it. We talk about death, the meaning, uh, uh, bones, uh, animated life, everything. So there's a lot in the table. I want you to make a final remark. Please do not bring it to personal issues, to the particularities of this issue, but bring it into ways that we can all learn from this and that you can bring what was the experience in this room of debating these different issues in order to improve this, the practices in our research. International research, good standard research, research with resources that are on the one hand money for research and the other hand uh, bounce to the, the research on. Uh, okay, Susanna, please. Yes. Just very quick, I would like to say that for me science is not an absolute failure. We also need to address the feeling of the community. Uh, so it's the same for the our community, our lay community and also the scientific community, it's the same to have here the skeletons or to go abroad, it's all the same because the science is above all, I don't think so. Uh, another uh, issue that to, we didn't raise, in, I'm not going to talk, just to raise the question, is the genomic issues. This also address genomic issues because these ones have genes. Uh, so they can do genomic uh, studies also with these bones. Um, and that is, that's it. Okay, yes, I'll try to be quick. Okay. Um, uh, just a thought. For me, uh, as opposed to repatriation, 
Social inequality due to economic factors for me is a form of violence. And it's very clear in some of the remains, and I know, again, some people don't care about the remains, fine, but others, they cannot afford to exhume and reunimate the remains. So for me, this is a form of violence. And uh, so I'm left wondering, so instead of using the unclaimed remains, why not opt to use the remains which we know the relatives, and the relatives don't care about them? Just do a proper social cultural study. Go and do an ethnographical approach to the unclaimed remains. Why not do this? Uh, another thing, the return to the community, then let's reach to the public, let's reach to the communities, not only public in general, because we all have bones and skeletons, and either are cremated or probably end up in a cemetery somewhere. And uh, use remains relatives, yes, and about uh, uh, are you treat humans as human beings? Some human remains are treated as human beings. A lot of uh, soldiers from Second World War, all over the world, and even from Portugal, from Angola, they are, they, people go to places, they, re, they exhume the remains, and they bring them home, and they rebury them. So there are bones that are treated as humans. And then you have the poorest of the poor, which are claimed. So this is all a, a lot of uh, issues that I've raised. And there are, I've always had a question about the lack of financial resources, the need for protocols. I, I personally never understood why, ooh, I'm sorry, but why didn't you just, you, you know the collection, you've studied here, why not just come with your students and study the remains here and bring resources? Because you know your colleagues from Portugal are excellent. I mean, uh, biological anthropologists from Portugal, training in Portugal, they are very good. I think I answered your question before. Earlier, I think I answered your question. So, uh, Ugo, you have the last word, and then I'll round up the table well, again, unless there's something uh, really, really Yes, I, okay. there's, there's one last thing that I'd like to say, and this uh, meets uh, Francis, Francisca's concern. I understand the notion of structural violence against individuals uh, when we're dealing with the unclaimed that are uh, the marginalized and the poor. Again, the context of cemetery collections and anatomy collections is very different. But they are, the poor the poor and, and, and the marginalized are part of the cemetery collections. And one of the most important things to me um, to actually uh, use the unclaimed, or the use is not a good word, um, but one of the good reasons to prevent these unclaimed remains from being destroyed and, and incinerated is that we actually have the opportunity to document and voice the lives of the poor and the marginalized that we would otherwise would not have. So is that worth the trouble of, of not destroying them? Because we have the opportunity to voice the lives of the poor and the marginalized. Furthermore, these people are being cremated, and when, when they were buried, cremation was an aberration. People actually stated in their wills that they did not want to be cremated. So things change, ethical concerns change, people's perceptions change, uh, but these collections are important for a number of reasons, and I just want to end with that, is that we have the opportunity to use the collections to voice the poor and the marginalized, which otherwise would not have their voices uh, heard. Thank you. Okay, thank you. This is not one of those sessions where, you, where the audience votes, so there's no winner. <laughs> you can have a last word, but I think we all learned from this discussion. If you have, uh, if you're happy, we'll close. Well, uh, you want to add something? Uh, 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 for me, uh, giving visibility in the context of poorness is uh, reinforcing the poorness. I don't, I'm not saying also, but I think there's, I'm not saying not to do it or to do it, I'm just saying that we need to think about it. Okay. Okay. So, we all agree that uh, research is fantastic, we all go into doing research and we should be aware that each act we do to lead to the research we so much want to do has some consequences. So we, if we get that awareness in our acts, in our practices,
I think we're better off as researchers, as a citizens. So thank you very much, everybody, for having been here for this long, and uh, wish you the best success, all of you, in the fantastic endeavor of studying the human past and the, all the implications that it has. Thank you.